Hi all, uh, welcome to the November webinar titled Using Inertial Sensors for Deep Data Analysis. When we're talking about inertial sensors, we're talking about things that the device can capture without the need of satellites and, and using GPS. So things like the accelerometers, which measure proper acceleration in, in force, gyroscopes, which will measure rotation, speed of rotation, and the magnetometers, um, which act as sort of a, a digital compass. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about using inertial sensors to, to analyze the data. And what this feeds into in this presentation is a combination of these inertial sensors being used within the algorithms um, specific to sports that we can analyze those sports in, in greater context. And here's just some examples of how our inertial sensors um, or the types of variables that our inertial sensors actually act upon. So we've got player load, free running, uh, cricket bowling, tackles, goalkeeper diving and jumps. And we'll step through each of these in a little bit of detail. So the, the first um, parameter that I want to discuss is player load and, and there was a presentation earlier on this year on player load, so I won't go into as much detail. I just want to give you some examples of how player load is, is used in the field and how it can be used for, for your analysis. So, in a sense, there's the, the player load formula. Uh, basically, it's just a, an instantaneous rate of change in the triaxial accelerometers um, with a square root and a, and a scaling factor to, to minimize the, the largeness of the number, so to speak. And so that works for using the up and down sensor, forward and back and side to side. And it's a combination of those three sensors. So essentially, how is it used? It's used, um, it's one of our most widely used parameters, um, and it's an arbitrary unit that just gives one number to attempt to represent, I suppose, how hard your athletes are working in that session. So sometimes, you know, distance and um, speed might not always cover everything you want to, want to analyze. So we've developed a payload. This payload algorithm is a, as a way of further enhancing your, your analysis. And I'll, and I'll give you some examples. So in this example here, um, we've got some real data up the top, um, and I suppose if you look at the picture down the bottom, they've all run 100 metres, but in a sense they're not all going to have the same play load for, for a number of potential reasons, and looking at some real data, at the top there you've got total distance sort of spanning from uh, sort of 9,500 metres, almost to 10,000 metres, and, and you look at the play load and there's also a a variance within the payload, and what could that mean? There could be could be a number of factors contributing to the higher payload, as it's based on the inertial sensors and the, and the rate of change of those inertial sensors. It's it could be that you know those athletes there, for instance, Usain Bolt in that hundred meters, may have a higher payload if he, for any reason, has changed force more rapidly. Um, or he might have a lower player load if he's more efficient in his running movement and he's not bouncing up and down or side to side as much. So you, you can take it on face value as a whole number, but it's probably more important to then go into looking at the individual contributions of, of what makes up that total player load number. But for this example, um, with the real data at the top, it's suggesting that let's call an athlete four with 9,618 metres um, that they've had the, the largest player load. And that could also be contributions of tackling, collisions and, and falling over, getting back up. All of those movements that aren't running based can contribute to that player load number. So 
to, to dig a bit deeper into that payload number, you can break it down into individual vectors. And this just gives you a percentage contribution of each of those three axes that payload is determined by. So you've got payload forward in the green, payload side in the aqua colour, and payload sort of up down in the blue. And you'll notice that the the blue or the up and down vector contributes to you know the majority of the payload and and that can be said because of the heel strike in running there's obviously a lot of up and down forces acting on the unit at that point in time and that contributes to the overall payload. But if you look a bit deeper into some of those numbers, you can see for instance athlete 30, uh, the fourth one in from the bottom, you know has a, a bigger contribution in that forward backward axes as opposed to say athlete 12, um, sort of three quarters of the way along there. So you can start to look at potentially the type of movement that a, that, that athlete has has done within that session. And again, if, if they all had run 100 metres and there's different contributions to that payload, you could potentially make some inferences about what might be happening there. And this is a, a, a good example of using those individual vectors for, I suppose, maybe even injury analysis. And I know there's been some work out there to suggest that when, when an athlete is potentially fatigued, their sort of vertical load or that up and down axis might reduce. Um, and they may adopt like a groucho running style whereby their the vertical stiffness is reduced. So the actual force on that up and down vector is also reduced and then in, in this example here they've actually let's say compensated using more lateral or more forward load and there's a, you can see there's a, there's a clear subconscious offloading of that vertical axis um, and a significant sort of recalibration of that loading fingerprint to what maybe would have been considered normal which is those first sort of five weeks there. Um, and on examination, it showed a, a pars fracture in the lumbar vertebra. So in, in this small sample size, it's, it's been able to identify potentially that this athlete has adjusted their technique um, with running due to the fact that they couldn't sustain that, that lumbar um, loading and that up and down load. So you could potentially use it as, a, as an injury um, injury sort of rehabilitation sort of tool or to monitor your athletes or potentially to see if, if at any point throughout a game or throughout a season that that sort of almost normal threshold falls away in terms of those loading vectors, is that contributing to you know, losing vertical stiffness and therefore potentially being fatigued? So there's just a few ways you can look to analyse the data um, without just looking at that holistic payload number. Another um, algorithm in which our inertial sensors play a part in is the, the free running. And basically the, the free running in, in short sort of looks at the cadence of, of an athlete and it does so by looking at the vertical um, accelerometer trace and looking at each peak. So in a typical you know, sort of free running state, the peaks and troughs will be quite consistent. And free running will look at that to suggest that that athlete is in unobstructed motion. Um, as a bit of an internal validation, what what we have done is is looked at you know running on a on a different course and and trying to see if you know we had a vision of this and and we counted the amount of time spent in what we thought was free running and, and what we thought wasn't free running and then looked at it against the output from our accelerometers and our inertial sensors and, and we found that it works it works really well and and what we did was we, we started in the top left hand corner corner here um, and we had a free running section indicated by the FR and then a, a non free running section. And you can follow the course around so we, we ran straight here and, and here we did you know twists and jumps and turns and fell over and got back up and and then we did a sort of a, an agility course and then ended by some free running. And, and what was shown was that about sort of 
75% of this course was, was it free running, which is what we predicted, and, and the other 25% was obstructed running. Um, and how, I suppose, teams are starting to use this is just to sort of categorise drills and, and look at drills in terms of a small-sided game in a smaller, smaller area might be, you might have less free running and more obstructed running. Um, and then in a larger scale game, over a, a larger area, you might have more, more free running. And, and what we've done is try and also align that to metabolic power and, and suggest that the, you know, that the more you're, you are in free running, maybe the, the less of an energy cost it is, as opposed to if you're doing more obstructed running, but for the same total distance, there's a greater energy cost because you've accelerated, you've stopped, you've been tackled, you've hit the ground and you've come up. So it seems, it seems logical. Um, and early sort of results have, have been positive in terms of correlating the two. And what uh, sort of a, an add-on to what I was saying in regards to um, the drills and categorising your drills, it, it, it's, there's a potential there for you know a return to play um, metric based on free running and, and benchmarking what a traditional conditioning drill would be in terms of a percentage of total time spent free running, full ground drills, match simulation and, and small sided games and then with your athletes coming back from injury there's a potential there to integrate them back in to you know these small sided games which has you know the least amount of free running so the most maybe reactive, um, the most change of direction, the most sort of obstructed movement and sort of reintegrating them to be able to cope with those demands and just by using a, a one holistic number such as you know time spent free running and I've just sort of I've just sort of categorized that here it, excuse the numbers these are just based off the top of my head but you know a category A drill might be traditional conditioning where there's 80% free running your full ground drills might consist of 65% free running match simulation, small sided games and so on. And you can reintegrate your athletes based on potentially the amount of free running or, or unobstructed running you want them to do. Uh, and I'll just touch on a few of our more sport specific ones um, in brief now. And the first one is our cricket bowling algorithm. And, and basically the way we've sort of come up with this algorithm is, is by looking at lots and lots and lots of vision and, and aligning that with specific accelerometer traces and, and trying to find and identify patterns that are emerging so we can actually identify um, what constitutes a delivery. And, and with cricket, I mean, it, it doesn't tell us too much by knowing the amount of deliveries because that's already known in, in a game of cricket, but what it allows us to do is it allows us to, when we've identified that a delivery has occurred, it's allowed us to actually put objective numbers on, you know, what's actually happening um, within the unit in terms of the forces acting on each of the vectors, um, the rotation speed of the gyroscopes, and we can start to feed that information back to, to bowling coaches. And this is a really um, novice sort of table, but, you know, the things we can get out of the cricket um, bowling is we can get a delivery run up, and we can derive a, a delivery intensity. So in short, what that is, is just looking at speed of at point of delivery and then looking at the rotational component from the gyroscopes and then formulating a, a delivery intensity so that each in individual delivery is unique and we can sort of put an objective number on the intensity of that delivery using the previous slide, using the numbers that are are sort of generated within these patterns here. Um, we can also look at things like peak player load within the delivery, um, which has typically been shown to be foot strike. So you can start to you know quantify and, and put objective numbers to, to specific instances in, in bowling deliveries. Uh, we've also got rugby tackles, um, which have been analysed using notational analysis and then compared to our devices um, and have been shown to be extremely extremely valid in terms of both the number of deliveries and um, that's delivery so the number of tackles 
and the actual magnitude of, of those tackles. And teams are starting to use this to quantify, you know, wrestling drills and tackling drills within training um, and creating benchmarks for matches and, and getting their athletes to be able to withstand, you know, the, the types of impacts and the number of impacts that they would achieve in, in games. I think lastly, um, we've got goalkeeper dives here and, and similar to the cricket delivery, we've We've looked at lots of vision and again looking through our accelerometer and gyroscope traces we can see that there's a specific pattern that emerges every time a goalkeeper sort of dives and lands and again now with, with this we're able to put numbers around the, the direction of the dive and numbers around the magnitude of the dive and, and how intense that dive actually was. We can, and that's, that's shown on the left there. And we can also get dive return by, by looking at the gyroscopes and the orientation of the unit to suggest that, you know, if, if, I, if I dive, my, the orientation of my unit is away from what would be considered normal in a, in a standing position. And then I can, you know, I can get the time from when I've landed because I know where the impact occurred until that unit is back to its normal position. So we're, we're calling that dive return. And, so a, a goalkeeper coach now can say, you know, a goalkeeper dived left and his return time was X. Um, so just giving them some additional information that they can use to potentially prescribe training or, or monitor their athletes. Uh, and lastly, what we've, we've got jumps through our um, inertial sensors and, and that's just giving us you know, how many times that athlete's jumped and again the, the sort of the height of that jump so we're using certain thresholds to cut off what a low jump would be, a medium jump would be and what a high jump would be. So that's just a sort of a quick insight into our inertial sensors and, and what they can be used for um, and thank you for listening.